Hello and welcome to Leo's Tech Talk. This video is to recall the first of three tragic events that changed NASA's space program forever. The three tragic events are During a launch pad test on January 27, 1967, a flash fire erupted inside the Apollo 1 capsule killing all the three crew members. 73 seconds into the flight on January 28, 1986, the Space Shuttle Challenger broke apart, killing all seven astronauts. As it re-entered the atmosphere on February 1, 2003, Space Shuttle Columbia disintegrated over Texas and Louisiana, killing all seven astronauts. Looking back on the events that led to the January 27, 1967 flash fire on Apollo 1 capsule killing the crew, in January 1967, the NASA-operated Launch Complex 34 at the Cape Kennedy Air Force Station, now called Cape Canaveral Space Force Station, Florida, was preparing for the pre-flight processing of the Apollo 1 spacecraft and its Saturn 1B rocket for the planned February 21 liftoff. The spacecraft arrived at the pad on 6 January 1967 and the workers integrated it atop the launch vehicle. The Apollo 1 backup crew of Walter M. Shearer, Don F. Eisel and our Walter Cunningham conducted a mock countdown on 25th Jan, with the launch pad service structure providing power to the spacecraft. The hatch to the capsule remained open during the test that was plagued by a series of glitches, both with ground equipment and with the vehicle. The test met its major objectives though it took several hours longer than planned. Grissom, White, and Chafee were scheduled to perform a test formally called the Space Vehicle Plugs Out Integrated Test and simply referred to as the Plugs Out Test on Jan 27. The principal difference from the earlier plugs in test performed by the backup crew was that when the countdown reached the simulated liftoff time, the spacecraft would switch from ground power sources to a simulated fuel cell power source, in a rehearsal of the actual launch. The crew requested that a spacecraft emergency egress drill be added to the end of the test. The evening before the plugs out test, Shearer from the backup crew met with Grissom and Apollo spacecraft program manager Joseph F. Shea in the crew quarters at NASA's Kennedy Space Center. Not satisfied with the number of glitches during the plugs in test, Shearer told Grissom that if things didn't feel right during the plugs out test, he should end it. At Launch Complex 34, engineers powered up the spacecraft just before 8 a.m. and verified that all its systems were in readiness for the day's test. Grissom, White and Chafee had breakfast with Shea and Chief of Flight Crew Operations Donald K. Deke Slayton in the morning of the test at crew quarters. Grissom asked Shea to join them in the capsule for the day's test to experience the glitches firsthand. Shea was willing, but after technicians explained they couldn't hook up a fourth communications link in the capsule, he dropped the idea. Following break fast, the three astronauts donned their space suits at 10 a.m. and began breathing pure oxygen from portable packs. Slayton accompanied Grissom, White, and Chafee to Launch Complex 34 in the astronaut transfer van. First, Grissom and Chafee rode the elevator to level A8, about 218 feet above the ground, and crossed the crew access arm that led to the White Room that provided access to the Apollo Command Module, enclosed in the pad service structure. At 1 p.m., assisted by the White Room technicians, Grissom entered the capsule and took his position in the left-hand couch, followed by Chafee who took the right-hand couch and White took the center couch while Slayton left to observe the test. A team of technicians remained at level A8 of the service platform outside the White Room for the duration of the test that was expected to take about two hours. Several teams monitored the Jan 27 test via voice telemetry and closed-circuit television. At the Launch Control Center also known as the Blockhouse, 1200 feet from the rocket at LC-34, a team of engineers monitored the progress of the test, as they would on launch day, with primary responsibility for the launch vehicle. Astronaut Stuart Arusa served as the spacecraft communicator who talked directly with the crew, and Slayton sat with him to observe the test. Skip Chauvin served as the NASA spacecraft test conductor five miles away in the acceptance checkout equipment control room in KSC, who communicated directly with the crew along with Rusa. Shortly after entering the spacecraft and connecting to its environmental control system, Grissom reported, a sour-smelling odor. The test was interrupted at 1.20 p.m. while engineers arrived at the pad to sample the air. Finding no anomalous readings, and the odor having dissipated, the test resumed at 2.42 p.m. The astronauts and pad teams closed and sealed the spacecraft's three hatches and pressurized the capsule with pure oxygen to 16 pounds per square inch, slightly higher than the outside air. For the next few hours, communications issues plagued the test. An unidentified microphone left in the open position contributed so much static that the crew in the control centers in the blockhouse and the ACE room had difficulty understanding each other. Controllers halted the test at 5.40 p.m. to let the astronauts reconfigure communications equipment in the spacecraft in an attempt to solve the problem. At 6 p.m., 
Chauvin instructed Grissom to proceed with a planned simulated hot fire of the command module's reaction control system thrusters, which he completed successfully despite the ongoing communications issues. At one point after the thruster test, chatter from Miami's air traffic control intruded on the communications link with the spacecraft. Chauvin then realized that Grissom's hardline communications link would be lost when the spacecraft's connections with the launch pad were pulled at the simulated liftoff time. This required reconfiguring all three astronauts' communication systems, further frustrating an already irritated Grissom. Communications checks with each astronaut followed, but the ground still had difficulty hearing them clearly. At 6.30 p.m., the count had reached T-10 minutes and was holding pending resolution of the ongoing communications issues. Grissom complained, how are we going to get to the moon if we can't talk between three buildings? White chimed in that they can't hear a thing you're saying, prompting Grissom's exasperated Jesus Christ. Followed by a repeat of his earlier question. At 6.30 p.m. and 55 seconds, engineers monitoring telemetry from the spacecraft noted a voltage spike in one of the spacecraft's electrical buses and other anomalous electrical signals. Ten seconds later, one of the astronauts, possibly Grissom, yelled fire followed in two seconds by Chafee yelling, Hey! We've got a fire in the cockpit. Seven seconds later, as White tried in vain to open the inward opening inner spacecraft hatch, Chafee yelled, We have a bad fire. We're burning up. Followed by a scream. Then radio transmissions from the spacecraft ceased, 18 seconds after the first report of the fire. In the confusion that followed, Chauvin and Rusa continued to call the crew, hoping they had a means to escape the conflagration. Shocked observers, watching the closed-circuit television feed, from the camera trained on the spacecraft's hatch noticed flames shooting from left to right across the window, indicating the fire started on Grissom's side of the capsule. They also observed crew movements that looked like attempts to open the inner hatch. Within seconds the entire window turned white as the spacecraft filled with flames. The pressure built up inside the capsule to an estimated 30 pounds per square inch, causing the CM pressure vessel to crack, sending flames and smoke onto level A8 of the service structure and causing concern that the flames would reach the launch escape system tower filled with highly explosive solid fuel. Three seconds later, communications from the spacecraft ceased. Upon first report of the fire, technicians rushed to the white room to try to rescue the astronauts, but the smoke, heat, and flames frustrated their efforts. Taking turns on the access arm for fresh air, the workers first removed the outer boost protective cover hatch that was only partially installed, then opened the middle spacecraft hatch, and finally the inward opening inner hatch. Their efforts took about five minutes, and many suffered smoke inhalation and burns in their futile attempt to save the astronauts who by this time had already perished. NASA flight surgeons arrived shortly after the pad crew opened the hatch and confirmed that the astronauts were dead. Slayton and Rusa arrived from the blockhouse soon after along with firemen who extinguished any remaining fires. Initial attempts to remove the crew proved unsuccessful because the intense heat had fused their spacesuits with nylon netting and other materials in the spacecraft. Firemen finally removed the astronauts at 1 a.m. the morning of Jan 28 and took them to the Biomedical Operations Support Unit, an Air Force medical clinic about a mile from the pad. Thank you for watching.